This week on the TT Show, Diablo 4 is coming to Steam, new Intel Arc GPU launches, Google's new Pixel 8 phones, the coolest new tech from PAX Australia, NASA's asteroid sample is about to get revealed, Elon Musk removes news headlines from X, Zeus has a new top-of-the-line gaming monitor, AI has birthed a new organism, and we sit down with Be Quiet to talk about PC building, coolers, and cases. Let's get into it. The Shadowbase 800 comes with exceptionally high airflow thanks to its open mesh design. It has three Pure Wings 3 140mm PWM fans that offer high airflow with quiet operation, a spacious design that offers enough room for even the largest components, such as 420mm radiators, simple and toolless HDD and SSD installation, state-of-the-art I.O. panel with USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C, easy-to-use cable bar for a neat and tidy look, rotatable PCIe slots enables vertical installation of GPUs, a tinted and tempered glass slide window offers a superb view that enables any gamer to show off the interior of their PC. And it comes with a three year manufacturing warranty. If you're looking for a new case for your PC, look no further than the Shadowbase 800. Head to the description below for more details. Welcome back to another episode of the TT Show. My name is Jack Connor. I'm a hardware editor over at Tweaktown and I'm joined by my co-host, Costa Andriatis, gaming hardware editor at Tweaktown. You have just been at PAX. So I think we should start off this week's episode with you giving us the inside scoop on what you saw at PAX this year. Yeah, so PAX Australia is uh, back for another year in Melbourne, um, you know, my hometown. And um, it was cold, even though it's spring. <laughs> That's like typical Melbourne. Um, yeah, so it was good to see, uh, you know, like big companies like Nintendo had like a massive booth with like, you know, Super Mario pipes and like a Super Mario themed booth for the new game. Um, they had like, and, um, you know, there was like a whole bunch of indie games, but like one of the big things was that like, you know, all the like PC hardware companies, like they, they had their booths, like Asus had a booth, um, Cooler Master. Uh, you know, LG had one for their Ultra Gear like monitors, and so it was like an MSI had a pretty big one too. And they were running C uh, Counter Strike two tournaments, which was cool to see. And um, and yeah, there was like a lot of like cool tech. So like I put up a piece over on Tweaktown, and we're probably going to see images like on the on the screen now if you're watching on YouTube, where I basically covered uh, eleven of the coolest bits of PC hardware and tech at PAX. And kind of like, like you remember like when we were at Computex and we were just walking around and you're just seeing all these crazy PC builds. Um, there was a little bit of that there, which was good. They had like this Sneaker X there again. Like I, I remember covering that at um, Computex earlier in the year. Yeah, so they had, yeah, so Cooler Masters Sneaker X is like a giant sneaker PC, <laughs> which is cool to see. And they had it on, on show there because um, they're actually selling a version with like a, one of the local PC suppliers in Australia. And it's like a custom sneaker PC and the, the model that they had on display had a 4070 GPU in there. Um, but the price point was like like five grand Australia. Oh my God. Wow, five grand. Yeah. And but I spoke to like the, the Cooler Master guy was there and, and he was saying like he was like pointing at all the like the little parts and he goes like we had to... Um, you know, like design each individual component had to be custom made, but not only just custom made, but then like they had to like, uh, you know, to be able to be produced so they could actually make, you know, like a hundred of these or whatever the case is. So like there was a lot of R&D to get it. Do you know how many they're making? Uh, no, he didn't didn't say, but um, there isn't like, obviously it's it's such a, like an odd thing. Like, I mean, it looks cool, but like, like there's, there's not going to be many people. Like, it's not a mass market. Like, no, you got to, you got to be into sneakers to be out of, and, and PCs, like a lot. <laughs> you got to be a sneaker collector and a, um, enthusiast level, uh, PC gamer to be even considering purchasing this. That, yeah. that Zeus 4090, that look, that case looks wicked. It looks like Knight Rider. 
Yeah, or it's a Neon Genesis Evangelion, the anime, the classic anime. Like they got like a whole range, like they call it the Eva O2. So they like it's the case, the motherboard, the CPU caller, which has like a full LCD color display and a custom ROG Strix GeForce RTX 4090 overclocked. And they had it running, connecting to one of their um, OLED panels and it was running uh, Ratchet and Clank in, you know, ultra wide with DLSS, like looking crisp. But that's like, that's another piece that that'll, that whole rig would cost more than the sneaker. <laughs> at like a Strix 4090, which is like one of the most expensive GPUs you can get. And this is a custom one. And yeah, this is like, custom. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah. The price tag on this is going to be f- through the roof. Like the motherboard, the, the Maximus Z790 Hero, which is like their top of the line motherboard, like that motherboard, you know, costs more than most people's PCs. <laughs> It's just overkill. It's just like the raw power that would have been on the um, showroom floor at PAX would have been ridiculous. Cool. Them up. One that like took my eye, like weirdly like, um, like so Yamaha, which is like a, you know, like an audio company. They do like, you know, pianos and speakers and they had like a drum kit and things like that. And like they had like pianos on display, like just actual, like, you know, the electric pianos and you know, like they, they've got like podcasting and streaming gear. So like they were showcasing that sort of stuff. And it actually all looks really cool. So I'm going to try and uh, maybe swing some of that gear for us. <laughs> well, did you get a business business card? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got, uh, man. Oh, yeah, you got the contact. You got the Yamaha plug. Yo, tweet down. <laughs> um, what else did you see? You got the Fallout Sugar Bomb PC. That looks wicked. Some of these mods, man, these are, wow, people just go all out, don't they? Yeah, so Yamaha, like at a distance, they had like a guitar on display. And I just thought it was a guitar because they had the pianos there, right? But then you go up close and you see like RGB lighting coming from inside the acoustic guitar. And it was like a custom, yeah. Yeah, it's in, in the, the piece as well. Like basically, it looks like a guitar, but then if you look on the back, you actually see like the the radiator cooling <laughs> and so it's an actual custom pc um the only thing is that like it's only got like a 2080 like an old gpu in there which is like weird but it was just like fun that they managed to like cram an entire like a full gaming rig inside an acoustic guitar and like on the side like they got like a cutout where it's got like the io panel and stuff On the back of it, yeah. <laughs> it looks like the Ghostbusters, um, you know, the, the pack that they wear to suck up the ghosts. When I was actually looking at it, like some like just random dude just walked past and, and then he like actually just like started playing it like, like vertically and it was actually like, so it's actually like a functioning guitar too. Oh my God. <laughs> I wonder what the acoustics would be like on that. <laughs> Probably not great. Nah, that is awesome. Um, so what else was there? Did you, um, was there anything announced or gaming wise? Well, like the good thing with like the, the cases stuff. So like, obviously like the custom builds, like the Fallout stuff, the Cooler Master Sneaker X, like the Aces Evangelion builds and like all that sort of like high end custom stuff was cool to see. But over at the MSI booth, they had like their Project Zero range and their Project Zero is like the custom case and oh, well, their new case and motherboard range, which um, is designed to like hide cables. So like you're only going to see like the cooler cable and like the GPU cable kind of like threaded through. And they had those PCs all set up with their new Gaming X Slim RTX GPUs, like the, the thinner slimline ones. And speaking to MSI, they said like they're, they're launching globally in December and their price points are actually pretty affordable. So like the case um, was like, you know, under 150 bucks Australian, which is- That's not bad. And like the motherboard as well is gonna be affordable. They're gonna support Intel and uh, AMD. 
So wow. Can... Do you have a photo of this that I can pull up? Yeah, yeah. It's in the piece kind of like towards... Um, down. So it's MSI's Project Zero and Gaming X Slim Range. Yeah, they had like a whole bunch of them there. Like they had like a bunch of those um, these PCs running uh, Counter Strike Two with like slimline forty uh, seventies and stuff like that, which was which was cool. And obviously, with you know Counter Strike Two, you can get pretty good performance out of that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Now you'll be cranking upwards of, well, depending on your resolution, like uh, upwards of a hundred FPS. Yeah, and they had their like their OLED displays there, and 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 they, um, MSI let me know that you know they've got like a whole new range of OLEDs as well coming early next year. Oh, so that leaked roadmap is con- it's confirmed. Confirmed. Like I told him, like I'm like, oh, he's, he told me, he goes like, oh, we, we can get a whole range. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we we leaked that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the TT show. Go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. We did leak that. Yes. Um, well, that's yeah, exciting. Are they, is it coming early next year or is it coming um, like later? Yeah, those new OLEDs are coming like early next year, like probably as soon as like January, they said. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Hopefully one, you'll be able to keep them all. <laughs> one other thing is that I actually got to use that Samsung Odyssey Neo G9, the 57 inch. Yes. I was going to ask you about this. What do you think? So I was using it with a 40... 40- 90 running ratchet and clank at the proper aspect ratio oh. yes it looked i mean because that game like with uh, with with rt and all the lighting effects and yeah like insomniac are just so good at, at making game visuals so yeah that looked nuts what did you think about the peripherals did it did, was it immersive or too oh, much yeah. um i could get used to it yeah, like I, I would have thought that it would be just too much. Like I've been like, I wasn't a fan of like the first like 49 inch sort of like ultra wides that came out like a couple of years ago because I was thought, ah, oh, that's just too wide. And like, you know, the field of view is like, it's going to be so specific. Like some games, it'll be fine. Others, it's just going to be a bit too much. But with this one, like I think just because the panel is so good that it's like, yeah, yeah, I could, I could get used to this. <laughs> you could get used to this. <laughs> you heard that, Samsung. Round up. Send them out. <laughs> um, yeah, wow. I wish I played uh, Ratchet and Clank. That would have been that would have been really nice, especially without the stretch. Well, just any game without the stretch. It was a, such a shame that the at the event, all of the titles that we were playing were all stretched on the G9. Um, yeah, just just on um, what else did I see here? That was interesting. The Orb X. <laughs> yes, that. What even is that? Okay, so let me just start with let me just start with the price tag that they had on the little thing next to it, it was twenty five thousand dollars Australian. Okay, so more well, basically a car, right? Like a somewhat decent automobile. Look um, at it. So what it is is it's fully mechanized, right? So like the the table kind of like oh well like swivels out, and you hop into the thing, and then you press the button, and then like the orb at the top kind of like closes on top of you, and then and then you get the display, and then it's got like inbuilt speakers, and like the the chair is like fully, you know. A, mechanically adjustable is that haptic does it vibrate no it doesn't and you'd think it would for that price you you think it would yeah you would you'd want it to be doing a a whole lot for that price wow i compared it to like the pod that darth vader sits in in empire strikes back so like like there's a scene like in empire strikes back where like you know one of the imperial stooges walks up to him and then you, you just see him like in his like rejuvenation pod like like Darth Vader just sitting there that opens and closes like <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome what panel um what monitor yeah. yeah like my only complaint was that they just had like a 34 inch ultra wide like I think like for that sort of like rig like you, you're gonna want like the massive one you want the biggest screen pod. you want the Neo Neo 9 
The the Geo Nine. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you- Last thing you want is to spend twenty five thousand dollars on a Orb X gaming chair. Like, I mean, what, I don't even know what it is, gaming station or whatever the hell it is, and and then like skimp out on and just put like a a standard monitor in there. Yeah, that these these show floor managers like you're showing tech to tech journalists. It's like that's the it, that type of stuff is going to stand out like a sore thumb. Like, it's just yeah. going to be obvious. Like, you sit down and you're like, really? The, you've got a $25,000 orb and <laughs> and you've got, like, a $50 monitor attached to it. <laughs> yeah, it's not practical. Like, it's cool. Like, this is the sort of thing that, like, at a PAX where you're like, oh, what's that? Like, it's going to grab your attention and you're going to sit in it. But Yeah, they're making, like, five of these. You think somebody's actually buying this thing? Like, I don't know. Like, like, where would you put it? Like, it's huge, right? Yeah, it's not for your average consumer. <laughs> like, like, imagine that was like your work station. Like, you just hop into your orb every day. And what if you want mon- multiple monitors? Well, you just have to get the 49. Work that in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. So, PAX was good overall? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Like, um, yeah, a lot of PC stuff, a lot of gaming, a lot of cool indie games as well from local developers. Um, yeah, Nintendo was there. They had like Mario and stuff. That was fun. And yeah, like PAX Australia is, is a good time, like especially if you're into um, the community side with like panels and things like that, which is really cool. Yeah, I've never been to PAX. I've always been interested in going. I've only ever been to um, Computex. Yeah, um, PAX is like a bit more like laid back, um, not as big as Computex, obviously. Um, but there is a lot lot to see and do there for sure. Like maybe next year, come down, we'll tag team it for the TT show. That'll be awesome. Would love to do that. Let us know in the comments below if you, wanted, you want us to do the TT show from Melbourne, PAX, Australia, 2024. <laughs> um we should move on to the next story. Did you you wanted to head straight into the Intel Arc? Yeah, so Intel has launched a brand new GPU, the Intel Arc A580. Now, it's an entry level 1080p GPU, but what is kind of like the big thing here is the price point, right? So it's 179 US. That is which, cheap. There aren't like Nvidia and AMD haven't launched a, a a a GPU at this sort of price range for ages, right? The last GPU that Nvidia launched, that was um, you know a low level entry level GPU, was the RTX 3050, which launched in the at the beginning of 2022, and that was launched for 249 US, right? So this is 179 US, um, you know, like. The 4060 is 299, the Radeon RX 7600 is 299, and anything below that is pretty much you're looking at like run out stock, like older RDNA 2 stock, discounted 3050s, some discounted 3060s. Yeah, previous or, gen stuff. Yeah, previous gen stuff, like something even a bit older, you're looking at the secondhand market. And, and that's kind of not an ideal situation because there's nobody really catering for entry level you know, somebody that wants to just get into gaming or just wants a really budget PC that can run games um, but doesn't have to crank the visual settings or whatever but can run modern games at, at a decent frame rate and which is like, you know, 60 frames per second for PC gaming. Like anything lower than, lower than that is like not worth. Oh, of course. Yeah. So what have you found so far? I'm guessing you have put this... Yeah. Uh- so the review will be live and... Um, as this episode drops and what I'm reviewing is this model here, the Sparkle Intel Arc 580 Orc OC edition. Um, it looks so nice. Yeah. So like I reviewed the Sparkle, the A750 uh, a little while ago, the Titan. And that one I said was one of the best looking GPUs of the year because it followed like a similar aesthetic to this, which is like they like really leaning into like Intel's whole blue color scheme. Yeah, just describe to the listeners, for those that aren't on video, what that card looks like. It looks gorgeous. 
Yeah, so it's a twin fan two slot GPU that is the shroud is like a a dark a deep blue and there are like flourishes like yeah and there's like white lines and like you know the fans yeah the fans are black so it kind of like there's a nice contrast there on the the the, the metal back plate is black and the PCI connectors are blue as well so there's like a nice little touch no, yeah. that card looks that card looks slick. Yeah, and like this is like an entry level GPU, right? And it just looks great. Like you don't expect that for like an entry level GPU. Um, the like initial impression was, wow, this looks cool. But the other initial impression I got was that, like, hold on a second, if this is an entry level GPU, why are there two eight pin power connectors? And the thing to to note about the Intel Arc five eighty is that it's pretty much just a slightly cut down version of the A750. They're kind of like mainstream GPU. Um, and so like it, to me, like they probably should have called it the Intel Arc A700 or something just to keep the, because it is similar to the A750 and the A770, just like cut down. And with that, you're getting at 1080p, 19% faster performance than the GeForce RTX 3050, which is currently retailing for more than this card wow so um, you think this is a very competitive launch i think so like like it, it's like somebody may turn around and say hey i can find a radeon rx 6600 right for 200 bucks us and that would be around would, would probably be slightly faster than this but that card originally launched for three hundred and thirty dollars US, right? So it's just heavily discounted, and that's like run out. So it's not available in all markets, and it's not something that's being actively produced or sold, really. So it's, I think, you know, like outside of those like cases where you can find, you know, like a thirty sixty for dirt cheap, a second hand this or that, like you know, there could be a case where like you could look at something else versus this. But for its price point, for an entry-level 1080p card, I think it's worth considering for sure. Um, I don't think it's like a slam dunk. This is the best budget GPU to get, but it's close. And the reason why it's not is that Intel Arc is kind of still... It's very new. Not 100% there, right? Their drivers have improved dramatically. So like benchmarking every game here, the 1% lows are great and the performance is stable. But there are games where you are getting some visual artifacts. There are some like bugs here and there. There are some titles like Starfield where it just tanks completely. Um, and that's something that's going to be improved like with new drivers and game updates. Yeah, that was going to be my next, um, well, my next question was you don't fully recommend this. Like, like you said, it's worth considering, but you don't fully recommend it because of the software and driver support just isn't there yet. But there's also like another factor as well. Um, so like, let's say you've got an old PC, right? You've got like a 1060 or or like a 960 or like, you know, like a, a card that's like five years old or like three or four generations behind. And you just want to just upgrade that PC and you just want something that's just going to get the job done and it's going to support modern features, which is, this does, like has AV1 encoding, decoding, um, it has AI hardware on it, just like the entire Arc range. And it's actually quite decent for ray tracing, but like with the caveat, this is entry level, so it's not recommended, but like it can handle- It can do it. Yeah. <clears throat> the thing is that it requires resizable bar to be a, a feature of your PC. So like it was kind of like in the 20 series or 30 series. So AMD kind of like resizable bar or AMD's version of it, which is like a CPU thing where um, if, you, if that feature is enabled on your CPU, you get um, like it improves the, the communication between the GPU and you get better performance. Um, and, and like when that feature was announced, like, it, like it's supported on modern NVIDIA cards and it's supported on AMD Radeon cards and stuff like that. And it improves 1080p. It's basically for CPU limited titles where we, where the CPU factors in, which is like, you know, at 1080p and stuff like that. Um, so without, if your CPU or rig isn't 
doesn't have resizable bar, which is like something has to be that has to be like a feature of your motherboard or and CPU, <clears throat> then you're going to get a significantly cut down performance of this card. So it kind of like so it's kind of like yes, it's it's great entry level, but like you may need like a new rig for it, or you may need like something recent for it to get the most out of it. So there are caveats to it, but I think that um, I think like the price point, like it's not it's not like super exciting, right? Like you're gonna see, like you know, the forty sixty and forty seventies, like they perform a lot faster than this. I mean that's a given. But there are like like examples where like this, um, like you know, Cyberpunk without ray tracing is actually really good. Like it's almost on par with like the 3060, um, and like Hitman with ray tracing, which is one of those heavy ray tracing games, outperforms AMD's Radeon 7600. So like Intel's ray tracing is better than AMD's. So that's when I was saying like the ray tracing is good, but like it's a like it almost even gets close to like 60 FPS at 1080p using the, you know, ray tracing. That's hardware. impressive for the price. Mm. It's very impressive. Can you see Intel as this, it catches up on more of the software side, really starting to be competitive with NVIDIA and AMD? Yeah, I think they're tapping into like a market with this, with the 580 so you got the 580, the 750, and the 770. So they're like kind of like the three main ARC GPUs. There's a lower level one, but I haven't tested that. And a lot of people say that it's just, it's really underpowered and, and not great for gaming. So like these three GPUs kind of like have similar architecture, similar GPU hardware inside. And they're just like, you know, this is the cut down version. Then there's like that version. And then there's like the souped up version. And, they, and the prices aren't huge between them. But if they kind of like focus on this market, which is entry level and mainstream, they could hit, they they could become like quite popular or, or they could like capture like a percentage that isn't being catered for right now. So like there is no 40-50 from NVIDIA as of now. There's no um, anything lower than the 7600 from AMD. So like, you know, that card is 269. So like there's nothing in the sub 200 or the $200 price range. And yeah, they can just capitalize on that on that price range and absolutely dominate it with um, very high value cards. Can you see, and this is pure speculation, I'm not sure of how this um, works out on paper or in practice. Could Intel release a GPU that has some sort of technology that enables better performance when you have an Intel CPU in your PC? Potentially, yeah. I mean, they, they, I mean, they create the drivers, so there's no reason why not. Because I can see Intel doing that, say if that technology is even possible. Um, Intel doing that and AMD doing that, say giving like another 20% performance across the range because you have two pieces of dedicated Intel and AMD hardware, NVIDIA won't have that option. Yeah. I mean, just talking about like, say I was, use, I'm using like the review drivers. I'm not including Starfield numbers specifically in my review because they just released like an ARC driver update that increases performance in that game. I just like the email like, like late yesterday by 150%. Oh my God. <laughs> and like they, like a couple of weeks ago, they released like a driver update for Arc GPUs for direct, direct for like another batch of DirectX 11 games that increased like, you know, performance in this game by 100%, this one in 120, this one by 70 Yeah, well, when the performance is zero, I suppose, right. 100%, 100% is nice. Like it's just more than zero. <laughs> Anything more than zero is 100%. Yeah, and then, driver software is getting better and like it's a lot better now than when it was when it launched a year ago let's just say and it will continue to get better and if they launch a next generation like they apparently they're working on so this is like the arc gpus the Alch which is like codename alchemist they've got like battle mage which is supposed to be their next gen lineup and if that's if they like continue to ironing out their driver the drivers and their software and 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 let's just say like the battle mage is targeting mainstream performance again, but they're able to hit like, you know, 
let's say like 40, 70 level performance at like $200 or something like that. That would be crazy. Something like that's a game changer, right? Yeah. Like there, there is like a market to, to release like a $200 GPU that as long as I can, you know, make money on it and it's feasible, like, you know. But with $400 worth of performance. Yeah. Or four five hundred dollars worth of performance. Like that's where I think that they need to get to. And if they get to that, then they carve out a corner for themselves. Yeah, and AMD would obviously follow suit with the same kind of technology. This mystical yeah, tech then might be forced to go. Hey, we need an entry level GPU that's that's powerful. Let's see what we can do. Let's let's now like make something like the 4060 a lot cheaper or you know like you know competition it's great for us yeah absolutely great for us pick it up at the low end price point is is what we want and yeah and i think this is a good gpu like surprisingly like i mean it's not exciting because it's just entry level but it is exciting because when you factor in the price and i mentioned that in my reviews that basically like when you look at this performance just bear in mind that the price point is significantly cheaper than the competition. Um, is that everything that you had on Intel's yep. new GPU? We full review, check out Tweaktown. The full review, by the time this podcast comes out, um, by the time you're listening to this, the review will be available on tweaktown.com. Make sure you go check that out. It'll also be in the description below. Um, we should move on to, should we do Diablo? Yeah. All right. So you talk to me about this because this one is um, more up your alley. Yeah, so I'm a big Diablo player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I finished the main story and then stopped playing. <laughs> I'm going to be jumping into season two. So like Diablo 4 is in a slightly, I wouldn't say weird space at the moment, but season one wasn't a huge um, success because it didn't really change the formula or really didn't add a lot. So like Diablo seasons kind of reset. So like you, when a new season begins, you start a new character, right? So you don't carry across your character. You start a new character and then and then there's new things in the season that you take advantage of. There's a theme and, and it's just for that season. And then after that three months, then you start again with a new character. That stinks. That's the um, works for some, some people don't like it, but if you can get it right, like with Diablo three, it's actually a lot of fun. So the thing with Diablo 4 is that like currently like, the, you know, it's not really in the headlines outside of like, oh, people aren't really playing it anymore. But with their second season, they, they're actually doing quite, quite a bit. Um, it's, I mean, first off, it's coming to Steam um, in time for the second season. It's the second Blizzard game to do so, which is pretty major because... Blizzard games have traditionally just been on Battle.net. Um, so coming to Steam opens it up to a whole new range of players. You'll be able to like, you know, jump in to you know, join with your Steam friends and things like that. What was the first game? Overwatch 2. I thought it was Overwatch. Yeah. I was thinking, I'm like, was it Overwatch? It had yeah. to be Overwatch, yeah. And um, yeah, so season two begins next week it's called the season of blood and it it brings major changes like it makes the whole leveling process to get to level 140 percent faster it improves like the um the end game so the end game of just like running dungeons over and over is now a lot more than that they've got like a whole tiered end game boss situation where there's five bosses and you know the first boss you have to once you get enough materials, you can summon them and then they have a chance to drop these like unique items specific so you can target farm bosses to get the right items and then these bosses get progressively harder and then the fifth hardest boss, which is Duriel, which is a boss from Diablo 2 coming back, that's back, that I think is in the campaign and, and Duriel has a chance to drop uber, uber uniques and one of the criticisms from Diablo 4 at launch was that they had these items called Uber Uniques and there's like a handful of them and the chances of them dropping were like one in a billion. <laughs> what? So, odds are that nobody will ever see those items, right? 
So now they've gotten now they're saying that like these Uber uniques they can drop on jury, right? So like you have to like you know there's you can work towards it. Like you have to like um, get these materials, you have to do these events and, and all this stuff to summon the boss. But then he has a significantly higher chance to drop these Uber uniques. And Blizzard state have said that you know if if you got like you know a group of friends playing Diablo Four, odds are that one of them will have you know Uber unique. Uh, these unique items in season two. Okay, so they're lowering the the drop chance for the item. Yeah. With the new boss. Yeah, and the new season is like all about vampires and there's new vampiric powers that are way more interesting than season one stuff. Like they're pretty powerful, like build augmenting stuff. They like yeah, so there's new vampiric events, there's a new quest line, new stories, and a whole list of like quality of life updates. Like, you know, gems no longer um, take up stash space. Um, they're just like a crafting material. Uh, there's all, all these like a huge list of quality of life and and apparently like they've like season two is kind of like their answer to all the feedback they got from launch from the June launch. So they've put like pretty much everything that people have been saying, hey, wouldn't it be great to do this or I don't like that or this isn't fun and they're tuning it for this season. So it's going to be a interesting one. So when it drops, there'll be a lot of people um giving their feedback yeah flocking back to the game or this is great again or this is you know how it was at launch or or not we'll we'll basically find that out next week okay well that is exciting maybe i'll jump back in and have a have another try at it because i literally as soon as i figured out that the character that i was playing i will basically get deleted as soon as i start playing season one I was, I was, I was like, this sucks. I don't know. I'm a RuneScape player. I've kept the same account for twelve years, just playing the same bloke that I've d- <laughs> that I've died countless times. And to think of that just being just taken away from me and then reset and reskinned with vampires, I'm like, yeah. that now, like, that makes me upset. Really carries over. So like all the bonus skill points, potions, and paragon points that you get from like one like you know we're doing everything in the main game like carries over from season to season now so that you don't have to re-grind to get all those extra skill points and stuff so if you if you have all your like renown which is all the bonuses that you get from doing everything in diablo 4 if you start a new season you're going to have like 10 skill points to immediately unlock skills to like you know you'll be able to get like all like you'll be pretty decently into the skill tree as you begin and then as soon as you like hit level 50 and get the paragon system you'll be able to like spend like 20 30 paragon points like immediately hmm okay so they've they've made the passover a bit a bit better and i've um i got to sit down with blizzard just the other day and talk about the new season and with all their like drastic changes i meant i spoke to them about like two things that people would probably want is an easy way to be able to respec and change your build so like you know with the paragon points and all the skill trees and stuff um it's if you reset everything to try a different build it's like it will take you like 20 minutes to get back to where you were before like redoing all the points and stuff um they know that that's a pain point and they're looking into it not with this season but like that probably be coming soon and the other thing is that if they're doing all these like drastic changes and they don't have a PTR, which is a public test realm. So like if you look at World of Warcraft, you even look at Diablo 3 or you look at any sort of like online game. Yeah, Guild Wars 2, I used to play the PTR. Yeah, so when they do like these huge balance changes and this season introduces a whole sweep of like character class changes and balance changes to make builds feel more fun and stuff like that. Um, I asked them, I said like, you know, without a PTR, like how... Are you able to really, really test this or even get feedback or fine tune things? And th- and they know that, that there's only so much they can do internally, but they are looking into it. And that is something that's potentially on the cards. They didn't obviously didn't confirm when or something like that will happen. But I think I think it's safe to say that Diablo 4 will be getting a PTR at some point. Oh, is that an exclusive? Is that a Tweet Town show exclusive? think so and i may have to just post this as news someone play the play the sirens like the boo, 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 boo. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> oh boy. All right. Um, we about done on Diablo's for coming over to Steam. Yep. Yep. Let's move on to the next topic. But before we do, I need to step away to use the bathroom. Okay. We shall be right back. Welcome back to the TT show. Sorry about that. We had to take a quick uh, break for the toilet, but we are ready to jump into some more news headlines. And we have big news coming out of Google. Yeah, so Google announces new Pixel 8 phones, Pixel Watch 2 and Pixel Buds Pro. So following Apple's big iPhone 15 announcement and launch, it's now Google's turn. And so now they are announcing their new phone range. So the Google Pixel 8 includes the new Tensor G3 chip, which will power the Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro. It's Google's in-house hardware and it's got advanced security options. They're now including face unlock. There's improved photo editing with AI and more. And on the security side, Google notes that it's going to provide OS and security updates for the Pixel 8 range for seven years. That is huge. That's huge news. That's massive. I'm pretty sure that's an industry first. I don't think there is, or at least to my mind, another uh, company that um, supports the OS, their devices for seven years. That's a long time. Yeah. And the Pixel 8 Pro, which is the flagship, it's actually going to go head to head with Apple's new iPhone 15. It features the company's new Super Actua display. It's the company's high, uh, brightest phone display to date and it's basically will be clear and bright and it's designed for ultra HDR and bright enough to be legible in direct sunlight. <laughs> and the other major update, of course, is like a brand new camera um, that has, uh, you know, it works a lot better in low light settings. It has a new ultra wide lens. Uh, for more light and detail and the front facing camera has been improved Um, it's got autofocus features for selfies and full pro controls which you can you can edit the shutter speed iso settings and all of that as part of the new 50 megapixel camera on the on across the pixel 8 and the pixel 8 pro so it is a pretty impressive um yeah move from google to to get more people interested in Pixel. And they've got their Watch 2, which is, you know, their version of the Apple Watch, um, which, you know, it it functions in a similar fashion. And they got their Buds as well, which, you know, basically like (laughs) their version of all the Apple stuff. (laughs) Um, Do we have a price point on either of these devices? Uh, Yes, we do. Let me bring that up. And you're a Apple iPhone guy. So I'm rocking the Pixel 6 Pro. Uh. And not spoiler alert, but Google are actually sending me a Pixel 8. Oh. So covering it with hands on for Tweaktown and the Tweaktown show. Hopefully, I'll, next episode, I'll be able to talk about how it performs and stuff like that. That's awesome. Cool. That's you great. Take shots for all my reviews and stuff as well. Yeah. No, that. um Google's range of phones, they've always held, I think, probably, they're not the best at taking photos, but they have the best post-processing. So, like, the camera itself isn't necessarily as good as, like, Samsung's camera in terms of raw performance, but Google's post-processing, the software... um, that they have inside of that phone, as soon as you take the photo, the ability to be able to remove people from the background, objects, jumping between portrait and non-portrait, like some of these features have just been staples of the Pixel devices and yeah, there you go. Um, And iPhone has just started to adopt them. Yeah, so I use the Pixel 6 Pro for for taking my shots for my reviews, right? Um, And I use the portrait mode and I have a, a, a decent setup where I can actually get direct sunlight so I don't need um, to worry about a professional lighting setup. So like, you know, I have the sunlight coming from the back and you can get really good shots that way of the hardware. So like if you check out my review of the new Intel Arc 580, you'll all those shots were captured with the Pixel 6 Pro. And I'm interested to see like how much of a difference the 8 makes. 
Um, but like, you know, the, the Pro, the Pixel 8 Pro, its price point is 999 US and the Pixel 8 starts from 699 US. So they are becoming more premium, right? So when Google first launched the Pixels, the Pixel phone line, it was like a, here's a budget smartphone that is you know, hooked into Android because it's their OS, hooked into all the Google, you know, Gmails and all the Google software suite. And, and, and that's kind of like what it was. And it, and it has been successful as that. And I think now with the Pixel 8, they really are stepping it up to say, well, we want to be like a Galaxy. We want to be like an iPhone. Yeah, I think it's $100 more than the previous generation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, which is like, I mean, the uh, iPhones are $100 more this generation compared to last generation. But yeah, you're right. With the, with the Pro, they're definitely trying to um, compete more with the more flagship models from Apple and Samsung. And I think they will be able to do it because they are cheaper, like you said, 999 And I'm pretty sure the new iPhone was um, 1099 US. But yes. if you were buying a phone that and you're deep within the android ecosystem there is no better android phone than the google pixel phone and if you are someone that is taking really nice that you enjoy taking photos and high quality video i mean the pixel is always a fantastic option um they do have it they got 128 gigabyte model huh wow like they start from i thought they were going to drop that off um, yeah, but so there's 256 and there's 512 and one terabyte for the Pro. And yeah, so the specs are in the the, uh, the full news report and like you can see like the specs for like the, the display, which is like OLED and the on the Pro, it's like 1344 by 2992, 489 pixel density, which is pretty crisp and they got like, they both have, um, well, the Pro has 12 gig of RAM versus 8 gig on the, the mainline one, but they both have the same uh, 50 megapixel wide camera. Um, but the Pro has like, you know, a quad camera with autofocus. So it actually, um, you know, it's looking to, and a telephoto capability. So it is like looking to to definitely like step up their game to, to be on par with like the high end iPhones. Yeah. No, I'm very excited to see what you think when you get this. That is going to be um, because I'm I'm about to order the new the new iPhone Pro Max. I'm just waiting for the color that I want to come in to my local Optus store. I'm excited because I'm like listening out in case there's like a doorbell because it could arrive today. Oh, <laughs> oh, mid show, you're gonna have to run back and be like, look, I've got it. <laughs> um, no, that's very exciting stuff out of Google. Um, yeah, Techtober is in full swing. Full swing. Oh, yeah. Um, is that all that we had on Google? Should we move on to let's do let's jump to some science. How about we talk about the um largest solar storm that scientists have ever detected? So I found this story yesterday. Um just for those that don't know. Solar storms um, constantly happen on the sun. It's, I think I've explained this before pretty grimly. It's essentially like a pimple being popped on the uh, <laughs> surface of the sun and the all of the um, plasma, all the charged particles that get shot out of our local star um, arrive in a wave. And if the trajectory lines up with Earth, Earth gets battered with um, charged particles. These charged particles are somewhat deflected. Well, they are deflected by the geo- the magnetic field of Earth, which is generated by the core of the planet being um, metal. But in the upper atmosphere of Earth, the charged particles interact with um, the molecules and then they create what we call auroras, which is the light that is... Um, pretty much bouncing off of the upper atmosphere and the 
and all of the magnetics take it to the poles. So it's like, have you ever seen one of those photos of Earth with like, if you Google Earth and magnetic field, it's like all of the lines going into the poles. So all of the charged particles typically head towards the poles, but during a geomagnetic storm, which is when the sun hits Earth with this charged blast of particles, um, the auroras move closer to the equator. Now, Earth gets smacked with these constantly and the geomagnetic storms, because they create the auroras, um, make for awesome events for astrophotographers that snap incredible, incredible images of these. Um, I mean, it, it, it looks like ribbons of color in the sky when it's happening, but they can get absolutely so powerful that it can wipe out electricity grids. It can um, abs absolutely screw up the magnetics of um, satellites. GPSs, satellites. Uh, what else can it do? It is... Um, that can cause fires by o overwhelming um, electricity grids and which can... Um, what is the specific... It's like ge the generators or something like that become overloaded and then they explode, causing fires. And in 1859, there was an event called the Carrington event that resulted in a global aurora display. So no matter where you were on the planet, you were seeing these auroras in the sky. Telegraph systems were wiped out. There was overall chaos. These sol okay. the or like we got to where we are now in terms of like satellites and elect you know, all that sort of stuff everywhere. Yeah, well, that's why I'm. I wanted to touch on this story because if this happened now, it would be it would be tragic. So the charged particles ejected from our local star collided with Earth's magnetic field and upper atmosphere, creating a geomagnetic storm or what is commonly called a solar storm. Now, researchers found evidence of the largest solar storm in that is in recorded history of Earth within the rings of ancient trees. These trees were sub-fossilized, meaning they weren't fully fossilized, and were discovered near the banks of the frozen river, uh, of banks of a frozen river in the southern French Alps. The tree samples contain huge spikes in radiocarbon, an element that rains down on Earth during a solar storm. Researchers dated the intense event back to just over 14,000 years ago, which coincides with evidence that was found in ice cores in Greenland of a main a solar storm happening approximately 14,300 years ago. Now, if this scale of event occurred today, it would be pandemonium. All of the, like your Google Maps system down, um, electricity grids would be, oh, I mean, there would be essentially be on fire. I'm not, I'm not sure if we are have the facilities or the appropriate infrastructure to be able to deal with a blast of this magnitude. Having auroras everywhere, especially like when they're that close to the equator, Earth is being battered, just yeah. battered. I don't even know what would happen. Imagine if the internet was wiped out for 48 hours. Yeah, like it'd be dark ages, right? Let's say like... Like you, where I was living in Melbourne, like we used to get like, like power surges all the time, right during summer. Like we'd lose like power for like six, seven hours, right? And when and like now where like phone lines are like connected to your internet, right? So like before, like you know, phone lines were like hardwired. So if you lose power, you can still pick up your phone and have dial tone, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's all like over over the internet, you know, phone over the internet, everything over the internet. And yeah, and like losing power for like, like there was one like bad one where we lost power for like a whole day. And and basically like for like several blocks. And so like you don't have, so like your phone, you can't really use it much because it's going to run out of battery. Um, so if you haven't charged it. And the suit, like what I'm getting at is that basically like you're like, well, I can't speak to anyone can't look at anything i don't know what's happening in the world right now um i walk outside there's like no street lights there's like nothing it's just like pitch black when it's night it's like like you know you're lighting candles and you're like i actually felt like living in like like an apocalyptic ap apocalyptic event <laughs> like it's like all right this is where i live in the world i don't know what's going on <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, imagine that for days, though. Possibly yeah. weeks as they're trying to rebuild the electricity grid because Earth just got smacked by just a bunch of charge parts. Just Earth was just in the wrong spot at the wrong time. But like, like, like you know, an isolated event you can manage, right? Like, imagine like a whole city was just electric grid and all that sort of thing was just wiped out because of solar storms. Well, imagine the f imagine the f financial impact, like the New York New York Stock Exchange down. How would you even manage like repairing and getting things back up? Like, what are you doing? Like, like carrier pigeon. <laughs> carrier pigeon. It's an Amazon carrier pigeon. It just, it's just got Amazon in, in like uh, spray paint on its side. <laughs> it's got the Amazon arrow. <laughs> yeah, we'd basically be in like a post-apocalyptic movie for a while. It would. It would be crazy. Yeah, I thought. I thought that was interesting. It's like the. Um, I wasn't aware that trees contained um, evidence. Of like uh, past solar storms, I, I didn't even know that they. I knew they absorbed uh, carbon dioxide. Well, their their leaves do, but I didn't know the actual trunk itself contains evidence of radiocarbon from ten thousand, fourteen thousand years ago, just showing how like the Earth over its course of its evolution has undoubtedly been just smacked up by the sun consistently. My question then is, <clears throat> like, how do they, can they even predict this? Like, I can't. It's I like can't. trying to predict an, predict an earthquake. It's impossible. Like, you, you don't know that the earthquake is about to happen until it's already happening. And then by the time that you've even detected it on, like, a seismic... Um, right. Like, it's like, okay, well, this is going to be here. And yeah. It, 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 oh, no, it's here now. That, that's, how, that's how quick it is. It's like, oh. Oh, no, it's here. No. <laughs> it's like, hey, get ready. Oh, it's already happening. <laughs> and then you got that bloke that's just like, hey, there's going to be an earthquake. And then it's like, yeah, it's happening now. I can feel it. Everything's falling around. <laughs> but luckily, we've got about an eight minute window because <laughs> that's how long it takes for sun to reach um, from the sun to earth. So, I mean, eight minutes. Eight minutes to save your game and shut down your PC. Yep, save your game, um, whack your phone on fast charge, uh, <laughs> get the generator up and running, make sure your PC's plugged into the generator. I don't know what games you're going to have to be playing an offline game. Um, <laughs> then you realize that like, sorry, you can't play this because you're not connected to Steam. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Put your Steam in offline mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like when like your internet drops, like like let's say you, like your internet drops, and it happens like every now and then. But like, have you just like like next time like your internet drops, just sit at your PC and take a minute to be like, well, what can I actually do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you just start doing um like those boxes on your desktop. You start just drawing boxes. <laughs> Does Windows Eleven still have Minesweeper? No, it doesn't. It has Minecraft. <laughs> yeah, Minecraft. Oh, that'll do. <laughs> All right, let's move on to another story. Um, where did you want to go from here? Um, let's keep it on the asteroid sample. Okay, let's talk asteroid sample. I think I've covered this. I've covered some of this in the previous episodes. Mm -hmm. So... This only happened a few days ago. NASA's um, Johnson Space Center took to its official X account to announce that the um, asteroid sample that it co collected through its OSIRIS-REx mission um, from the asteroid Bennu, which is, I'm pretty sure, the largest asteroid in our solar system, um, will soon be revealed. The details um, will be coming out on... 11 a.m. ET on Wednesday, October 11th. So as of recording time, that is, um, that'll be tomorrow, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Find like billions of year old fossilized like alien bacteria or something like that. Finding bacteria would be insane. That would be legendary. But oh, yeah. what um, is interesting about this story is... When they received the capsule from it landing in Utah, 
they opened the top of it and there was a <laughs> it was there was actually a major problem for nasa it's that they had too much material on top of the um I don't, I don't know what to call it. I, I called it in my chamber, uh, in my chamber, in my news article, a chamber that collects the asteroid material. But when that, when they landed on the asteroid Bennu, they anticipated that it was going to be rock, like a hard surface. But it's actually a metallic, uh, they thought that because it's a metallic asteroid, but when they landed on the surface, it was more like fluffy. And then all this dust went everywhere landed on top of the capsule and then when they opened it back on earth they were like oh no this is a lot of material this is more than the 250 grams that cup that we went billions of miles away to get <laughs> um <laughs> there was much more material than they anticipated so they're taking longer to process the asteroid samples um than what was originally anticipated so now Next episode, we'll go into what they found because I'm guessing that they're going to do a um, a broadcast at the time that I mentioned earlier, talking about the percentages, the elements that they found of um, what was inside of the capsule, how much metallic me uh, metals, hopefully uh, a bunch of um, age dating as well. So they'll, they'll do a similar thing that they did to with... Um, the trees, the, the radiocarbon dating, they can see back, oh, this tree experienced a massive uh, uh, hit of radiocarbon 14,300 years ago. They can do the same thing through different te techniques through the um, asteroid materials. So we should be able to find out next episode exactly how old it is. If I was to put a guess, and maybe we can do, a, maybe you could guess as well. I'm going to say 4.7 billion years. I think it's going to be a very old asteroid, given that it is... Um, metallic being floating on essentially the outer solar uh, the outer rings of the solar system it's going to be an old one i'll go a little bit um i'll cheat a little bit and do the prices right rules i'll just say 4.6 billion years old because if i'm closest without going over uh, you know without uh, going too much over then i win <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is safe that's safe um yeah, so they've had this uh, asteroid sample since September 24th. It has undergone preliminary examinations. And um, yeah, very exciting stuff. It's NASA's very first asteroid sample that it's ever collected. It's not the first asteroid sample um, that, the uh, that has been ever collected and arrived back on Earth. I'm pretty sure the... That um, record is held by JAXA, the Japan Japan Space Agency, the Japan's equivalent of NASA. But yeah, so next episode we'll have to revisit this and see what they found. Yeah, it's cool because, um, <clears throat> like you mentioned in the piece as well, and last time, like asteroids are like the building blocks of solar systems. Um, you know, like they collide, like you know, billions of years, like you know, like craters and they collide with planets and mix and match materials and they're like building blocks of like planet formation and you know life on earth as we know it today could be you know the direct result of a specific asteroid impact you know at a certain point in time that collided with this and that and you know it's it's all fascinating stuff they uh, astronomers and i mean astronomers planetary scientists and anyone else that is interested astrophysicists they're all interested in asteroids because they are the clues to how the solar system and by extension earth uh, how it came to be to what it is today and like you were saying asteroids such as bennu which is a, a metallic asteroid um, there's obviously different types of asteroid out there and comets are frozen, like basically frozen big pieces of ice cubes that are sitting out in the outer rims of the solar system. Um, but each contains clues about how, um, the evolution of the solar system by through what you were saying, collisions, um, collisions into planets where you could say, for example, an asteroid um, that is like Bennu metallic smashes into earth lots of the asteroid 
uh, transferred to the planetary body while the uh, other part of the asteroid breaks off and goes into a completely different orbit around the sun. This happening thousands, perhaps millions of times over the course of the evolution, the billions of years of evolution of the solar system. Um, yes, yeah, scientists can rewind time and track all that back and... Perhaps with the materials that NASA has just acquired, we can start to piece together how the building blocks of life arrived on Earth. Arrived in quotation marks. They could have naturally formed here on Earth, but there is conflicting theories about how that happened. It's like, did water first, did water just emerge on Earth or was it brought here by a water, like a, a comet? that was completely frozen a massive comet just smacked into earth and then melted and now we've got water and maybe that changed the climate of the planet there's a lot of conflicting theories in this um uh what would you call this the study of earth's evolution but yeah these asteroids yeah they've got the clues and um we're going to find out some big news next episode awesome um shall we flex hard off asteroids into windows 12 charging a subscription fee yeah so last week there was a rumor and this has a rumor that's been bubbling up for a while that microsoft will be implementing a subscription service model for windows so what that means is that you would not purchase a Windows 12 key and that's a lifetime key, you would install your OS and then pay whatever it is, $20 a month, $100 a year or $10 a month, whatever it is to use the operating system. And that would be a seismic shift in how Windows operates. And <clears throat> there was a German site that um, noticed some things in a Windows preview build that was all about subscription services and types and things like that. And that and that brought the rumor back up to the top saying, well, <clears throat> they're putting all this code in there and it's talking about subscription and status and your OS. So that means that the rumors about a Windows 12 subscription service are true. Um, but then everybody got upset naturally <laughs> oh i'm upset I, it's a rumor and i'm upset about it and then windows central um a reporter there uh basically confirmed or basically said that that's not about the version of windows that we use it's about an enterprise subscription model which would be a for a next gen version of windows where at the enterprise level or the business level people will just subscribe or that windows to you know businesses will be charged a monthly fee for windows 12 so is it is it a enterprise model now that people are upset or was it always going to be a enterprise thing because i can really see windows doing this with yeah. the release of copilot and ai features like if they said to if they announced um we're rolling out uh, Bing Chat, which is the underlying technology is uh, GPT 3.5 or uh, GPT 4. Um, but it's in, it's embedded in Windows through co well, which which is now Copilot on the desktop. But you've got to pay you know ten dollars a month for you to use it. And then, then you get you unlock a bunch of new features. It's not just AI powered. You've got way more customization, X, Y, Z. I can 100% see them doing that. Yeah, so exactly, and so can I. So basically the word from insiders is that this is not for the customer version of Windows 12. But like you said, with Copilot and all the telemetry, uh, telemetry that's already in Windows 11, which is like 100 times more than what was in there in Windows 8, and how that feeds into ads and um, edge and all the internet services that you know know exactly who you are <laughs> and what you're about and feed you everything right um, so like I would see it like as this like I think Windows 12 will may have like a, a soft launch or maybe like we'll, we'll lean into subscription where you'll be able to get a Windows 
12 key or upgrade just like as you do now. Um, you pay your fee. But things like Copilot, things and a lot of the features will be ad supported. And then potentially if you want to remove the ads or um, have access to more features or things like that, there'll be like a premium subscription model. Yeah, I can I can 100% see them doing that. All these companies are about is like ongoing revenue, right? And revenue stream. So like if, if you get a million people that buy Windows 12 on launch day, that's it. They're not going to repurchase it. But if they use it for five years and they pay a little bit every month, then that's better for the bottom line. That's more money in the long run and things like that. So, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't put it past them, but it seems that this specific smoking gun, so to speak, in terms of like, hey, look, Windows, Microsoft are going to be charging you for Windows 12 and Windows 12 is going to be the subscription model and that's how it's going to launch, um, looks to not be the case as in this specific that whatever they found but like it's obviously there so like there's obviously they're thinking about it yeah they're heading in that direction that like yeah. like maybe they haven't decided yet who knows i think i think they've they've decided and they're like all right we're not gonna do it yet <laughs> but yeah. we're gonna do it <laughs> maybe it won't be windows 12 maybe it'll be 13 or 14 but i can see i can so easily see windows just coming out and just saying look if you want to use the best version of windows um uh, uh, sorry if you, i can see microsoft coming out saying if you want to use the best version of windows you need to pay per month for this yeah it's going to be like Same. when adobe started making photoshop um yeah subscription based and That's luckily luckily well. because i was such an avid photoshop user um back when i was in high school i acquired a student code for cs6 when it first came out so i've got a code that just unlocks and i've got it on every pc it just infinitely unlocks and i do not pay a subscription and you won't get my money adobe i'm just gonna say <laughs> i've i know the code <laughs> and i'm not telling any listeners the code either so don't bother commenting that um <laughs> you can give me the code <laughs> maybe we can sort that out mm. um yeah that's interesting I i'm glad i'm glad it's just a rumor at this stage but yeah i can don't i wouldn't say hold your breath on this one yeah and changing things to this week's sponsor be quiet who are a german company that are basically geniuses and high high tech engineers when it comes to calling cases um let's just cut to my interview and or oh, sit down and chat with kevin tabor from be quiet um the sponsor of this week's episode but um yeah they were kind enough to just join for an informal chat to talk about their new products but also just to talk about pc gaming and building and the whole diy experience which is a lot of fun so let's jump into that chat now Okay, I'm joined by Kevin. Oh, it's, I, mean, I was about to like. <laughs> you Kevin almost had it too. You almost. <laughs> from, from be quiet. That's okay. T A B zero O R and uh, zero zero R. It yeah, sounds a lot better. Yeah. It's like I your like cool it. hacker name. Yeah, exactly. Tape zero R. Icebox. Tape zero R. Oh man, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just like dive straight into it, like. PC cases, especially in the DIY scene, have been around for, for years now. Um, and, you know, new models come out every every year. There's obviously new CPUs, new GPUs, there's new cases. Uh, when it comes to cases, like, do they evolve alongside, like, CPUs and GPUs? Like, is there innovation that can s still happen in the case space? Because the Shadow Base 800, I mean, looks great and the specs are great. But, you know, like, from, from somebody who may not even understand how it all works, like, <laughs> it's not just the same case every year <laughs> right yeah and you know you, you kind of put it uh nicely do 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 the cases evolve with the hardware as it as it's changing right because because the the hardware um that is released comes out once maybe maybe twice a year right sometimes there's a cpu drop sometimes a gpu drop sometimes it's both sometimes it's neither 
right? Um, and so the cases kind of have to be spaced apart a little bit when it comes to their release and honestly having relevancy because it's releasing later, right? Um, when it comes down to it, the case, you're kind of stuck in this little, well, you're stuck in a box. <laughs> Get it? Because that's really all that it is, right? Whether your box is big or it's small. See, big box, mm -hmm. big box. And then we have, there's a small box over there. And then I have another big box over here. And then yep. there's a small box over there. It's all about different size boxes, right? So how do you now make a box appealing? So RGB. <laughs> RGB is one way. Yeah. Uh, ask Thermal Take. They know all about RGB on everything, right? Mm. Uh, they're from their power supplies to their fittings to everything, and which they did a great job on. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the they were uh, some of the innovators when it comes to having uh, the the trios, like the trio fans and the and the oh, quad yeah. fans. You know, when they had all these different layers of RGB that nobody else had, right? So there's something to be said when. Uh, you're, you're having this hardware kind of advance uh, in a rapid pace, and then you have these cases that now have to try and catch up, right? Uh, so you ask, you know, how, how, do, how do we try and um, basically make it better, right? Mm. Is, there, is there room to even make it better? Because like I said, the Shadowbase 800, wonderful case. I, I mean, it's, it's designed nicely. It, it works really well. It's very straightforward. Most of the uh, random nuances that you might find when building in other cases just simply aren't there with this, which is nice. Um, but there's there's also that, that part where it's like, okay, so how do we make it fresh? How do we make it new? How do we make it nice, right? Um, so part of it is innovative RGB uh, design, which as you can see behind me, you have this like RGB strip that's going around the, the case there yeah. uh, along the bottom, which is kind of neat. Um, now that's part of the 901, but that's also part of the Shadowbase 800. That line that goes across isn't, but the line does go down the front side of the case, right? So now we have this RGB that we can utilize, we can make it look nice, and then how do we pair it with some of our other products that then complement that RGB? That's only one way, right? One of many ways. Um, but we like to pride ourselves on performance, right? We're, we're a German-based company. Germans are very... Known for very the engineering. <laughs> known for the engineering, exactly. And sometimes even over-engineering, which, for better or for worse, can really actually have some pretty innovative features, right? Um, so with the Shadowbase 800, we really designed it for maximum airflow. And it's just basically set up so you put any air cooler in that, it's going to have enough surface area and volume inside of it that it'll be able to churn up all of the hotness inside and spit it out, right? Yep. Bas basic terms. Those are technical terms, by the way, spit out and yeah. Um, but the the innovation really starts to come when you start looking at like our, our higher end cases, especially like, like 901, right? Shadowbase is this this perfect mid-range case where, where I say I say mid-range, it's that perfect all-round case, right? You want a water cool, boom, you have enough room that you can put two 360s in there, no problem. It will fit a 420 in certain, you know, configurations, yeah. a little bit tricky. Uh, however, it's that that best bang for your buck solution, right? Um, with the 901, you have a removable uh, radiator tray that has, uh, that you can put your mount or your fans, your radiator, and everything pretty much all wired up and good to go, and then it just sticks Slots right in. back inside. Yep. yep. Uh, I can actually take this one apart while it's running and pull it apart because it's just pogo pins. So once you run all the wires and everything to it and put it onto this radiator shroud, that's, that's it. There's, there's no more to it, um, which makes part of the whole process of building a PC, which is cable management, a yeah. lot easier and a lot nicer. And that's kind of where you start to bring in some of these innovations, right? Definitely. Being, being able to give offerings that uh, are actually usable, right? RGB is great, but like, yeah. what can you do more with it than just be a box and put your stuff in it? I, I think for me, like one of the, I mean, you may know like trends based on like what you hear from the community and stuff like that. Like cable management has become like, like uh, there's always been like cable management, like a neat cables, even like you go back like 15 years, there's always been people that just want to make sure that the cables are neat in a PC. And you know, you, back then it was just like, all you had was like a, a cable tie just to tie something up 
just to make it look a tiny little bit neater. Yeah, the little the little <laughs> yeah. twist things that always broke, you know? They yeah, had the no. little two little nubs on them or whatever they were. Yeah, yeah. They never stuck right. They never stayed. And they didn't really hold all of your cables. So, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And, and now it's like we're getting motherboards with, like, cable connections on the back. We've got, you know, in the... Um, just in, even in, in the new case, the Shadow, we've got, like, cable trays and, like, you know, neat cable management, which is awesome to see because there's so many cables involved in building a pc it's ridiculous like you don't realize it like you get like every time you build a pc you put all your you lay all your parts out and you go yeah, it doesn't look too bad then you connect one thing you go all right there's a cable you connect your next thing well there's another cable you connect <laughs> and it's just it's just never ending yes the the cable avalanche as we call it because man that case looks so good from the front but turn it around yeah not so great and uh yeah behind the curtain yeah yeah exactly it's the it's the homer simpson meme right you know everything looks great up front and is just all tied up and and slammed together in the back um and you know uh i've been building pcs for a long time so i I understand because like i I mean hell we used to have uh uh, different colored ide cables you know that had different uv color you know glowy parts on it so when you put your cold cathodes in it would glow different colors and whatnot and I mean, you're, you're talking thick cables. Hmm. I thought it would have kind of like slowly started to go away, but it didn't like at all. No. It just like it's still there. The 24 pin still as thick as ever, like that like zero gauge wire that you used to run in your car type of thing. I, I mean, it's just it's insane. Um, so for me, it's it's it, it's really great that we're making a lot of steps towards putting cable management as one of the main topics that we're putting in place when we're talking about our new cases and our new designs. Um, the cable trays, like you said, Shadowbase 800, got them in there. It has the removable one that's on the front um, that covers up the 24 pin as much as it can and yeah. you know the USBs as much as it can, right? Um, but and then in the back, you also have those different trays, right? So you have these actual channels now where you can lay your your 8-pin EPS cable to go up all the way to the CPU and it doesn't look hideous and you don't need 800 zip ties in order to make it look right. Um, I come from the background of cut it to length and then repin it out. But that's a whole nother long process and that's called OCD. And not a lot of people (laughs) want to deal with that like I do, right? Um, So no, it's kind of, it's neat to see how um, a lot of manufacturers, including ourselves, um, are, are using that space in the back side of the case um, to actually allow cable management to, to happen, right? Uh, Shadowbase 800, perfect example. The front, the front uh, uh, power supply cover, that just pops yeah. right off. Boop, pops right off. So you can just jam your hand in there, do whatever you need to, and then pop it right back on. Yeah, and cover it. Yep. So, you know, we're trying to make it a little bit easier because that's that's a giant pain in the butt. You're trying to jam your hand in there and connect the, yeah, that's a that's a pain. Um, so we're trying to make ease of use uh, a, a lot more accessible to everyone, right? We want to be able to not only have you and I build PCs, but my my daughter, right? She's eight. Yeah. She should still be able to do it, right? Um, and they, we want to be able to branch that across across all ages, and races, and shapes and sizes, right? Definitely. I mean, that was going to be like, I think my so like next point was that um, PC building for veterans is like normal, right? Like you get your CPU cooler and you're like, hey, all right, that goes there, that goes there. And it used to be a lot harder in terms of like pin headers on motherboards. Like you didn't even know what was what. You took a guess. You go, I think this one's going to turn the PC on. Maybe, yep. maybe not. We'll find out in, in a few minutes. But uh-huh. now you've got like, I think. I mean, PC building is ubiquitous, right? Like, there's so many people all over the world that are putting together their own rigs. I mean, PC is more of a DIY scene than a off-the-shelf. There are off-the-shelf PCs that are great, but in most cases, people are, you know, looking to to build their own. Um, When it comes to that side of it, like, how difficult is it to, like... I mean, do you just say, like, all right, we, we want somebody who's never built a PC to be able to look at this case or look at this instruction manual and go, oh, yeah, this won't be too difficult or this is going to be a fun project as as opposed to, like, let's try and decipher what this means, this schematic <laughs> or this map. It's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky question to answer because we are a German-based company, right? Hmm. 
So obviously the instructions are perfect right out of the box. There's nothing wrong with them. There's no details ever missing. <laughs> right? Yep. Okay. Definitely. So that being said, though, uh, in the DIY space, you have so many different people um, that speak positively uh, about different brands, uh, about our brand especially, um, that that wasn't there before, right? Um, is it difficult to build a PC? Easy answer? No. No, it's not hard. It's re it is not that difficult, I promise you. Doing it as a practice when you're pushing out 10, 20 PCs a week, sure, yeah, okay, that gets a little bit more challenging because you're having to do it over and over and it's repetitive and somebody that's never done it before, now you have this infinite amount of information that's on the internet here, right? The interwebs, you can go on here, yeah. type in a couple keys and boom, here comes Tweaktown with a, with a how-to guide on how to pick out the right parts. And here's the link that's gonna push you to PC Park Picker. And here's where yep. you're, you know, you can then take a screenshot and dump it to Reddit and then some other guy's gonna yell at you because you grabbed the wrong graphics card, right? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of information that's now going around, which is kind of neat, uh, that, that wasn't there before, right? When, when I first started building computers, I, we were, exactly what you're talking about. Is this the two pin header to turn it on? No, all right, let's touch it with the screwdriver until it does, yeah, no, yeah. oh, there it is, there it is. Okay, that's it, that's it, that's that, that's that one. And then we would go through the whole process, right? Mm. Um, now you got Gigabyte who gives you a little like thing. Yeah, the cheat. Yeah, the little cheat, you just, and then you just right onto the motherboard. I'm like, man, this, this is, that's taking all the fun out of the game, like. <laughs> Everybody wants to smash up their fingers when they have everything together and they forgot to plug those two pins in, right? Um, so for us, it's it's kind of difficult to say that we're trying to be open to, to the the uh, the newbie, right? Um, because we we do pride ourselves on our high end uh, components that that we produce, right? Our cases are are top notch. Our fans are one of the hot, top rated fans that are out on the market. Um, our radi or our all in one coolers also competitive with everybody else. Um, and then you have our heat sinks, right? Those are super high end, really nice, big chunky mammas mm. that, that look great as well as perform great too. So do we try and bridge that gap? Yes, the best that we can, right? And how do we do that? Well, one is me being here with you, you know, talking to the, uh, the audience and stuff like that, um, but also doing some of our more educational pieces, uh, going to events, going to shows, talking to people about how to build it, you know, what interests them in building it. And then kind of just getting their excitement level up, right? Because it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not just about this name, right? It's about the feeling you get, right? I mean, it, it's the, the easiest way to put it is it's, it's adult Legos. They're a lot yeah. more expensive. They can break a lot easier. Don't drop it on the ground because you can't put it back together, okay? So it, it really is. And if you take your time and you're reading the directions and sometimes you have to go back, sometimes you have to go, you know, you got to go back and forth in the manual and that doesn't seem right. And well, that's written very Germanly. And, you know, that, there's, there's a lot of things that you kind of have to take into consideration. But um, we try and be uh, the, the, the best product that we can be for anyone that wants to engage uh, with, with our type of product. Um, that being said, our manuals are relatively straightforward. We do have a lot of really, yeah. really good YouTube videos, uh, especially that our product I mean, team, that, are, yeah. you know, that, that create. Uh, so there is a lot of, again, a lot of the information is out there. Um, it's just how do you want to approach it, you know, as, as, a, as a consumer and as an enthusiast. Definitely. Um, and when it comes to, like, I mean, the, the Be Quiet fans and calling the AI calling and, and you guys are known from for, you know, high quality fans, like you said, as well as, you know, the cases and stuff. Do you, like, how important is community feedback to the the process for refining or or looking at, um, you know, if there's a need that needs to be met or like a different style or, or is it a case of, um, you know, you guys are just always on top of things without having to 
or, or knowing where, <laughs> where the industry is going without actually looking at it. <laughs> well, I, I think if you uh, feel that you are on that high of a horse, then you probably need to say whoa and slow yeah. down a little bit because uh no no i think i think everyone can learn uh especially from the community right um i hate i hate to go here but reddit is a perfect example there's yeah. a lot of people that cry there's a lot of cry babies there's a lot of people that just want to complain and there's a lot of people that want to tell their life story yeah that's all good and gravy but again it's that information right and people want to read it they want to see it they want to feel it they want to know what it's about right so if we can get some of that feedback that's actually constructive not just going oh this pile of garbage without realizing or knowing or doing research or anything like that we want to then take that and utilize it for either our revision or our next product that's coming up for example i'm gonna i'm gonna divulge a little information that's not supposed yeah. to come out yet we have a new cooler mm -hmm. okay it's coming actually for Is it you in the background <laughs> all right so for you and for you only this is the new Dark Rock Elite. Ooh, this is nice. our new cooler. Um, it's fantastic. It's awesome. It, it really is fantastic. But th the, the best part is how it installs. Okay. If anyone has used all of our, any of our, our, our older stuff, which is awesome, as is, cools really, really well, you know, performs even better sometimes. Uh, this cooler can pretty much go together and be put on your CPU in a heartbeat. It's insane how fast it is. Um, the top part just comes mm -hmm. right off. And then originally there used to be two holes that were through the top here and then you had to like stick a giant screwdriver through. Don't, don't, don't worry. We still include the screwdriver. Everybody wants it. We still include it. But the fan now just comes out like that. Oh. There's no, yeah. And then, oh, okay, I gotta put this back in. Let's get the cable out of the way. That's the right way. Oop, done. That's it. Back together. And then you pop your tray back on. And wow, look at that, my cooler's back. And it's now mounted. We wanted to make one of the best coolers ever. We're trying, we're trying our best to do it. Uh, however, we wanted to make sure that we implemented some of the, 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 the feedback from our community, exactly what you're saying, uh, which was installation for the previous model was a ginormous pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. Can you please, 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 please fix this? And as a person who has built plenty of PCs prior to even working at this place, that was a giant pain to put together. Now this, oh my goodness, it's literally, it's there's two screws on the bottom, just one, and then two, you screw that in, the fan goes right on top, boom, you're done, that's it, that's, 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 that's it, we go home, <laughs> we go home now, right? So, ease of use, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that, that wouldn't have come out on its own. I mean, yes, of course, the, the, yeah, the, mounting, right. the mounting mechanism is bad, but we do not make a bad product, so therefore, we have to improve it. And so how do we improve it in a way that makes it easier for you and my daughter to be able to put this in, right? It shouldn't be rocket science. It's not. No. It, it's really not. It's Legos. So how do we make Legos available for everyone, right? Awesome. Are you an air cooler or liquid cooler CPU guy? If you could see my, uh, if you could see that better, no, that's a full water cool, water cool, yeah. water cool. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a water cooled kind of guy, but I'm not gonna lie to you. I did just build my first air cooled rig, um, in. Well, I, I don't want to say twenty years, but maybe twenty twenty years. Mm. Yeah, something like that. Um, I'm thoroughly impressed. I'm beyond impressed the fact that it will still cool somehow my 7800 x3d i don't understand how it doesn't really make sense how but it does and there's nothing there's nothing that can compare to custom water cooling don't get me wrong but this 
Yeah. I put free uh, space uh, by air cooling. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, don't worry about the closed loops because this is, this is all you need. <laughs> it is tough to justify me spending 1800 bucks on my water cooled setup when this is performing. I mean, it's not as good, but it is pretty darn close. It's close enough. Yeah. And if, I mean, you can't beat the price point either, right? You know, I mean, I, I, that's one of the biggest things is that you, when, you, when you're talking about air cooling and water cooling is that if you're talking about a closed loop system, AIOs, they, they got a shelf life. Every single one does. I don't care what manufacturer you are, they have a shelf life. Whether it's one year, three year, five year, whatever. Certain number, and that's it. These don't. The only thing that it has is the fan bearing maybe dies, but the fact that yeah. it's made, well, in Germany, it's a rifled bearing, and it's yeah. a specially designed fan for <laughs> this cooler. <laughs> I have a tough time believing, yeah, I'm having a tough time believing that that's going to die first. So You'll be gone before this fan. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. You know, um, people kind of get angry because they last so long. And I, I get yeah. it. You know, like the fans are just surprisingly good for how long that they run. So when um, when that hitting the market. So this actually is on the 24th of October, which is in two weeks, technically, from when we're recording this. Um, but yeah, it'll be uh, the 24th of October. It'll be available hopefully on Newegg and on Amazon, but definitely on Newegg for sure, 100%. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, yeah, I won't take up too much more of your time. Thanks so much for all of that. Um, yeah, everybody, check out the, the latest cases, the latest calling. Be quiet. I mean, if you know PC building, you you know the brand and... Um, and now you know the face <laughs> behind it all. Yeah, make sure if you guys are at any of the events or you guys are going and doing anything like that, um, we'll be at PDX LAN. We'll be at um, Comic-Con LA. Uh, we'll also be at CES. We'll be at PAX East. Uh, and that's as far as I know so far. Um, but please, keep us in keep us in your, your, your mind when you're looking at other PC parts, you know, or if you're looking at new cases or fans or anything like that. Don't don't set us aside. You might be surprised on what you find. And we are back. We hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Be Quiet. They make some of the best cases on the market. Some it is always a pleasure to catch them at Computex and see what they're working with. Um, but. Before we finish off this week's episode, we should jump into some more headlines and maybe yeah. we power through these ones because we might uh, be a yeah, bit there's a couple of quick time. Ones. I have a quick one on because we've been following the Nintendo Switch 2. We all want to see it. We want in, NVIDIA DLSS powered Nintendo Switch that can they can do some 4K visuals. We want that to come next year. Hashtag so DLS, DLSS Switch. So the, the news isn't doesn't confirm one way or another that the Switch 2 is still coming, although rumors are still saying it's on track for late next year. But no, kinda, Nintendo are never going to release another Switch. Kind of supports that. So they're basically saying, but they what they're saying is that they're going to work on supporting the, the existing Nintendo Switch with software, which is games, until March 31st, 2025. So that means that for the next financial year for Nintendo, which begins on March 31st, 2024 through to March 21st, 2025, they're still going to be supporting the existing N Nintendo Switch with game releases. And they've got games planned to release on the console up until March, 2025. What does that mean for the Nintendo Switch 2? Well, it just means that, yes, it could still come at the end of next year or towards the end of, end of 2024, and that Nintendo will transition across to the new console and they'll continue to support the existing hardware, which happens all the time. Like, you know, PS5 came out, Sony was still releasing, uh, they were, you know, Sony and other people were still releasing games for the PS4. The Xbox Series X comes out, and yes, there's still Xbox One versions of games coming out. There's always that sort of like transition period. So yeah, there's always going to be a Passover. Yeah, so the Nintendo president, Shintaro Furukawa, didn't actual comment on the Switch successor, but always just reaffirmed their commitment to the existing switch and which companies are always going to do like they're not going to say hey we got a new console coming out in, in a year and a half so wait for that 
So in the meantime, don't buy any of our products until then. <laughs> yeah, just cannibalize their current console that they're trying to sell. <laughs> but yeah, of course they're not gonna. Yeah, they're not gonna confirm the the Nintendo Switch. But what, Nintendo is going to release a Switch too. It's yes. the Switch is one it's of their given. most successful consoles of all time. We are ecstatic to see what they can cram into such a small form factor, and especially with it being rumored rumored to be powered by um nvidia's um soc the what one was it again it was the was it lovelace uh no it's ampere ampere yes sorry correction um but wait i just read something in here that i wanted to talk about hold on give me one second mm -hmm. oh sorry this is um the, the original nintendo switch um came out on march the 2017 so the the timeline of it lining up with march coincides with like the launch of the original yeah. nintendo they could yeah, that's right like it could come out now in early 2025 it feels like it's such a long way away though because it like feels like we're ready for it now but being nintendo like you know hey like it, they'll they'll come to the party at some point yeah, if I was to guess what's going to happen, uh, what's going to happen is the Nintendo Switch will lose support around, well, lose support in March, and then we will see an almost immediate announcement, teaser, reveal of the coming Nintendo Switch console. And then later throughout the year, we will see the full reveal, probably at a Nintendo Direct. I reckon we'll yep. probably see a teaser because Nintendo likes to do this um, at the last five minutes of their Nintendo Direct. They like to tease what's, you mm. know, some of their biggest things. I remember when the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate teaser came out because yeah. everyone was waiting for the new Su Super Smash Bros. And we were watching a Nintendo Direct and at the end it just was Mario... And you could tell it was the Super Smash Bros. Mario and everyone was like, oh, mm -hmm. it's coming. It's re it's coming. And then everyone was hanging for the next Nintendo Direct. So I can see him doing something like that. And along the way, we can expect more leaks, I reckon. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like my prediction or like my guess, like educated guess based on, you know, what I see and I'm just like making up some equation is that like the, the current Nintendo games that they have, first party games that they've announced that are in development for the Switch, there's obviously could be more and especially if they're going to be releasing hardware or software until March 2025. Like their existing titles is like a Princess Peach game, a remake of Luigi's Mansion 2, which was I think on the 3DS and also a remaster of a Paper Mario game from the GameCube. So these aren't like major, major titles at the Zelda level. The existing Super Mario Wonder is like an offshoot Mario game that's out this month. But the Super Mario Odyssey team, they did like an open world sort of like Bowser's Fury thing for like when they re-released -re like Mario 3D World on the Switch, which was like a Wii U game. Um, they created like this like, you know, five, six hour like little open world Mario thing. There was a lot of fun. But Super Mario Odyssey is from their mainline Mario team. They're working on something that hasn't been announced. I think that's going to be a Switch 2 launch title. Metroid Prime 4. Yeah, Metroid Prime 4, which which is kind of like being put on the back burner. I think Nintendo are just holding on to it until like the next hardware. I think like they like their major games, they they're waiting until the, the new hardware. Well, it'll be there'll be another when did Super Smash Bros come out? Super Smash Bros Ultimate Every like the, the funny thing with Smash Brothers, like every single Smash Brothers is always the last one they say. And then it's like, well, all right, we'll do another. Yeah, and um who is the director of that game again? Uh Sakurai. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah, we're not sure if he's gonna be making another game because he almost like kills himself when he's yeah, developing know. these There's games so much just detail for the long in these hours. Games. Like those Smash Brothers games are just so full of detail that it's insane. Yeah, it is. Well, I think it's the best fighting game ever released. And um, 
yeah, we're not sure. There's, it's kind of like somber in the Smash Bros. community at the moment because we aren't 100% sure if there's going to be another title. As is there, uh, as, as there always is when there's a new Smash Bros. game coming out. But mm -hmm. everyone wants Sakurai to make the game. Like we don't, yeah. we almost don't want another Smash Bros. If Sakurai isn't making it, or is is not at least involved in it. Yeah, that's right. I think like it, he will be involved in some capacity for sure. Like he'd have to be. Well, that's like, exciting. Even if he takes a, even if he takes like a back seat, like you know Miyamoto, who like created Mario and directed Mario sixty four and all, like you know, the GameCube ones. Like he wasn't the lead on Mario Odyssey, but Mario, but he was obviously. You know, he's one of the creative leads overseeing everything at Nintendo now. Um, but, you know, Mario Odyssey, in my opinion, is the best Mario game. Hands yeah, down. I know for sure. I finished that. That was great. Yeah. So, like, you know, when, when that team actually releases their next Mario game, which, you know, which will once again, like, you know, just prove like how far ahead they are <laughs> in other developers when it comes to making fun games. Awesome. No, that is great. Um, what else did we have? We should jump to... Okay, we've done the capsule. Um, what about <laughs> still, that? Hey? At the ROG OLED? Oh, yes. This is something that I wanted to shout out um, Zeus for. This looks like a very fun, very fun monitor to game on. It is a 49-inch 5K ultra-wide gaming monitor. It is the... Rog Swift OLED PG49WCD. Um, it recently got announced. Um, it is Q OLED for the Quantum Dot. Um, it has a resolution of 5120 by 1440. The curved display is a 100, uh, 1800 R curvature for enhanced immersion and supports 10 bit color. Um, with Quantum Dot technology delivering an impressive 99 DCI-P3 color space. This looks like a fantastic monitor and I definitely mm. want to test it because look how thin it looks. Look at that. Yeah, that's so good. That's like one of the things about OLED is that the panels can be so thin. Yes, and it's got the same, same back design as the um, other OLED that I have here from Azus. Um, it is the, and my review is currently live on Tweet Town for this. It is the PG27. Oh, yeah, the 27 inch. AQDM. Oh, I'll just yep. um, pull that up now for the people on YouTube. Um, Zeus review Tweet Town. There it is. Editor's Choice Award. Let me yeah, no, that was, I've never felt more dangerous in Apex Legends than when I was using that monitor. Fuck yeah, that's a good quote. It was... Um, 0 0.03 millisecond response time. Company yeah, and I'm currently testing a Aegon um, monitor with 0 0.01 and that feels nasty. It feels so good. But yes, it's got the same back design as the... Um, as the 27 inch here, which is a very nice touch. I, I love the thinness of OLED, it makes the monitor look more aesthetically pleasing. And this kind of like backplate, it gets hot, it gets very yeah. hot. And oh, OLED panels run hot though. That's the thing. Like if you stand next to like an LG OLED TV that's been on for a while, it's like a little heater. Mm. They generate quite a bit of heat. And that's one of the reasons why- I just they, wanted to highlight this, uh, this monitor here. It just, it mm. looks like a lot of fun. And yeah. um, hopefully, Azus is going to send me one out. So, if any listeners are interested in um, upgrading or seeing what it was like to um, game on such a an egregious display, mm. um, stay tuned on Tweet Town. I'll see if I can sort out a sample and let you guys know. I would definitely be keen to hear your thoughts on that because, like, forty nine inch after, OLED. After seeing the fifty seven inch, I'm like, maybe these these thirty four inches ones like aren't big enough. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe, maybe forty nine is. Maybe it's time to to make that jump. <laughs> it's time to pop the cherry forty nine yeah. inches. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little dirty. Um, <laughs> okay, let's move to a news story before I get myself in trouble here. Uh, um. 
should we talk about Elon Musk um, fire like yelling at people on on X <laughs> that that don't like his uh, recent change? <laughs> yeah. Oh, how Musk. weird! Did you saw that change. That change just looks weird. It's like you see an image and it's just got like the the website name in there. It's like well, what what is that? Okay, so for those that don't know who uh, what we're talking about, um, if you are a X user, formerly Twitter, mm-hmm. um. You may have noticed that news links on the platform now only show a preview card, which is the the social image that is included within the news article. There is no headlines anymore. Yeah. And the summary for those um, news articles, I'm pretty sure, are included in the um, initial post itself, depending on if you've got auto posting services um, to get your articles up, this is more so publications. But if you are just a user that is just wants to share some news from, I don't know, like, um, Tweak Town, yeah. for example, there will be no headline in there. And this change came directly from Elon Musk. He he said this back in August that um, news headlines would be removed from X for, and this is quoted, greatly improved aesthetics. And is the story here that he mispronounced aesthetics? Um. Well, that's what he wrote on his X profile, so... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, as a billionaire, you can make spelling this, errors. This update has been rolled out, and now there are people very upset with um, the headlines being removed. With some of the criticism actually making good points. Initially, I was on the side of, okay, get rid of the headlines. That'll reduce clickbait incentivization. So... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's like it's a bad idea. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, like that would actually look better because you got the image. But yeah, there is like an argument for it, uh, like for having the headline because then you lose context, right? Exactly right. And some, they, this person, Aaron Levy, um, tweeted at Musk and said, I just want to make sure I get this right here. Um, it was such a fantastic point. Um, I scan tweets to see what news is most interesting to read. Removing headlines puts too much on us on the OP to put the context in the tweet itself. It requires reading even more text for the consumer. Much better to get the marker, including the publishers, to decide what headlines to go with and users are smart enough to figure out what is clickbait and what is worthy of their time or not. Essentially, Mm. what he's saying is that through the removal of headlines, people now don't, don't have context towards what is included within the news article, so then they have a tougher time deciding what to click on. Initially, he says that the value of news on X on the entire platform has dropped because of this change. And the value is tied into the speed of which you find news on X. Because there are no headlines now on um, on the social media platform, people won't be able to find news as fast as they were uh, as they did when there were headlines on the platform which i think is a very interesting point i I don't know if links news links will be performing better or worse now i think i would have to wait a few months and again x isn't going to release that data like 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 even if it's just like a like a review and like you know, like it's like, you know, a specific model or a specific product and you have a picture of that product and underneath the headline is X product review, right? And if you saw that, if you're interested in it, you'd be like, oh, I'll check out that review. And the text to that review might just say like, um, you know, we'd just be like a, a takeaway to say like, like, wow, like I can do this, blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't really tell you one way or another. It's just like a comment on it. But like if you don't actually then know what that image is referring to as a link. Yeah. And I think the um, his res- like Elon Musk's response, <laughs> I mean, the dude is like so abrasive and, you know, when he has an idea, like that's it. <laughs> well, it came straight from him. Yeah. yeah. 
And then literally like, straight from him. He 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 thought not only would it improve aesthetics, it would allow the timeline on X to be more compact, which would mean that users are able to see more posts on their timeline because you'd have more real estate. Yeah, he also has a pretty big axe to grind with traditional media sources and especially yeah, clickbait headlines. Mm. So I can see his angle. I really can. I don't know how it seems but, like it's yeah. more personal for him than it is in yeah. benefit to the consumer because yeah, yeah. you really want he constantly says that um twitter or x is the hub for the news that's where you find the news the fastest because you got the most people talking about it i believe that is true but it won't be the hub if no one can know what's inside the stories that they are popping up on their timeline. Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's say, now it's like what um, Levy said was now it's up to the person posting the link to make sure they've got a hook within their tweet that goes to the story because you can't see the story headline anymore. So now mm. when I want to post, I don't know about the new Intel Arc GPU, I have to be like, this Intel, here's a great review on the Intel Arc GPU instead of just like retweeting it because then I'll just be retweeting a photo of the Intel Arc GPU. Yeah. Like, like let's say you found like a review that you like, right? And just, this is like innocuous stuff. This is totally not political in any way, right? It's just a hardware review or a product review. And you're going to tweet a link to it because you read this review and your tweet is, I'm going to get me one of these. And that's it, right? And then you see, then if you've got the headline, you've got the context, like, oh, so you're interested in this. In but the review is, of this, yeah. Yeah, if all it is is just an image, you're like, all right, what does that mean? Like, is that... like what? Yeah, you get an NFT, what you, what's going on? Yeah, what's yeah, what's what are you talking what about? about? Yeah, it's a real. I'm on the fence with it because obviously the social every social media platform is riddled with um, clickbait, divisive headlines. Um, I'm, I don't mind clickbait headlines when the clickbait stuff, like the hook, is actually backed up by fact. And yeah. you know, like say for example, NASA telescope photos supermassive black hole surrounded by a ring of stars. Yeah, that might be have- seen as a bit clickbaity. But that's exactly a head, a head, what happened. A headline, it's a competitive business, right? So a headline needs to be clickbait in a sense, right? Like it has to be because you're trying to get somebody to click or you're trying to grab an attention. And if you want to call it clickbait or you want to call it attention grabbing, like this goes back to like newspapers in the day, back in the day. Their main story on the front page will have big text that will say, we're at war, exclamation mark, World War II, right? And that's... That headline is both like informative because there'll be an article telling you about it, but it's also to grab your attention to say, buy this newspaper for 20 cents. It's like, you know, and and that applies to everything that, that we do at Tweaktown, right? Like we ensure that all our coverage includes, um, you know, the data or like the information that and the sources and, and what you want and what you need to know and, and the facts and, and, and opinion here and there. And because, you know, you know, we are commentating on things. But like there are like, you know, the dirty, like the actual bad clickbait where you see it on Twitter and it'll say blah, blah, blah. And then if you click on it and then, you know, like especially if it's about a celebrity or something, right? It'll be like, where is this person now? And then, right? And then you'll get like 20 pages of like their entire backstory reworded from Wikipedia and IMDb, like their whole career with like 15 different ads and then at the very bottom, we'll say, "Where are they now?" Oh, they're at home taking care of their family. <laughs> yeah, you know, they haven't been. They haven't been in a movie because they're now like just looking after their family, or they've retired, right? And and yeah, and the headline is like, "Where are they now?" Blah blah blah. They, this person has disappeared. Blah blah blah. Like that is like dirty because you there's no justification for it other than to get you to scroll through 15 ads to get to a one line thing that should be there. Yeah, like we include pertinent information in our bylines. So like the headline and the subhead, um, we include, you know, like enough information in the first couple of paragraphs where if you're not interested in, in the story, you don't need to click to get the full report. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see if this will improve the experience on X or make it worse. I, I, think I have I, a I, feeling that he's going to roll it back. 
Yeah, but, I think it makes it worse. But yeah, we'll see. This is um, all part of Elon's strategy of move fast, break stuff, <laughs> learn quickly. <laughs> um, that yep. is... That is literally his strategy at SpaceX, mm -hmm. and he takes the same approach over at um, X. That is, yeah, yeah. He has that, an that, X to grind with with media for some. Well, obviously, like you know, if you're in the spotlight, you, you know, one bad report. Now he's like the entire. Like he can't generalize like at that level. Like you actually like his response was, "You believe the media? Wow." It's like, what do you mean? Like you believe the media? Like, yeah, I like think what? he's. I think he's talking about more like traditional media. Yeah. That's why then, I think like, it's more of like a personal kind of, mm. um, like okay, now Business Insider can't write egregious headlines about me because I've changed the entire social media platform and how it functions. <laughs> yeah, like maybe that's why he did it because like he doesn't want to read those headlines about him. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> let's move on to what else do we have here? Um. Is there one final story? I can talk about the oh. weird walking robot. Yeah, before we get into that, I'll, I'll just do one super quick headline. Windows 11 getting native RGB controls. Oh, yes. So RGB controls for, your, obviously, which is your lighting, you know, your GPU, your CPU, coolers, your PC, your keyboard. All that RGB requires custom software from the whoever... The hardware maker is you know if it's msi you've got mystic light if it's asus you've got aura sync if it's razor you've got chroma if it's logitech you've got the g hub you know like every thing has their own software for customizing rgb when windows are have implemented native rgb lighting controls in windows 11 which is yay it's like great news right but it comes with a big caveat that it only supports a handful of Razer peripherals at the moment. No and Philips here. No, well, I've got it. I'm. I've got a the Black Widow V4 keyboard that I'm using, um, which is a really good mechanical keyboard, and that's the only device that's picked up by the Windows RGB native lighting controls. And all and all you can do is select a color or uh, change the brightness and like a few different effects. So it's so basic that it's great to see that they've added it, but it's still is it though, a long way Is to it go. really great to see that they added something that like there's only that, one that, thing that's on there and yeah. it's got three controls? Is it great? It, is it well, nice? Well, maybe it just means that from now on that hardware makers will just make sure that it's supported by that or like that maybe there's an API that they can plug into all their devices from now on and then maybe but yeah maybe not maybe it's not great news because like do you think, <laughs> i've just i've just changed my mind I just, i've convinced you this oh, is no, garbage you just, costa you, you just changed my mind like mid sentence and mid thought i'm like yeah because like do you think like i'm now i'm thinking about it, i'm like do i actually think that the windows 11 controls are going to be as good as the msi and the asus and the razor chroma controls like the there's four options cost settings and like you know like how are they going to add all at that the stuff in there yeah yeah <laughs> there's, 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 there's nothing here it's not even worth i'm not even going to update windows to get this that's how that's how little change <laughs> this had you know what they should do they should Look, all of these lighting software controllers, MSI, Corsair, all of that. The IQ software is probably my favorite. Um, oh, yeah, IQ. That's they're the all built one. on... They're all supported by Windows. They're all running through Windows drivers. Mm. Windows should just aggregate all of your software into this thing. And then we can just change all the lighting through windows they shouldn't release this half-baked thing that like one thing works on it mm. this is garbage yep <laughs> this this i want because i've got philips hue everywhere and i've also got the elgato lights i would love absolutely love if i could change um my elgato key light and my Philips Hue within one piece of software. Currently, I have to go through the Elgato command center to change the bloody light and um, the Philips Hue app on my phone or the desktop app. Put it all in Windows. Let me do yeah. it all from Windows. It's all connected like maybe, to like, yeah. the Wi-Fi. Like maybe they can get it to a point where it's way more in-depth, but as it is now, yeah. Like it's, it's not indicative of a robust tool to customize RGB lighting now. 
Like there's nothing in there to tell you that this is going to be <clears throat> a great feature, even though it's like cool that you can actually do this now in Windows. Like you'd think that this would have been something that would have arrived in Windows 10. Mm. Yeah, no, it, it does look... I'm, I'm just checking if I've even got it. I don't think I do. No, you have to opt in to like the... There's like a tick box where it's like get access to features early or something like that. I ticked it. I ticked it like as I was writing the news story <laughs> just so I could check it out. And then I'm like, all right, let me do that. And then <clears throat> as I was finishing the news story, I rebooted. And yeah, the only device there was uh, my Razer keyboard. And that was it. I'm like, okay. But then all I can do is just change the uniform lighting. Like there's no access to per key lighting and all these other features that are there. Oh, like the almost like the reason why you download the software for <clears> your... Uh... Yeah, so you still need the software. Yeah. <laughs> you still need you still need Razer software yeah. to be able to change it. Mm -hmm. Really? Well, like, well no, well, no. Like, I don't change the color for every key. Yeah, but like, will this software work if you uninstall the Razer software? Like, yes. through Windows, will you yes, be able yes, to yes, change yeah, the yeah, individual yeah, lights? Yeah. I used it just... To, I did it. I, I set a color and I lowered the brightness. So, now it's like an orangey color and it's not that bright at all yeah but do you have synapse installed yes but i don't run it because it's a system resource hog yeah it is it's disgusting i'm it's just thinking like if, if windows actually make this really good there might be no reason to download any of the you know yeah. synapse for example mm. if i can change all my lights on my razor keyboard through windows basically put it on breathe or or whatever change the yeah. brightness and maybe set like a color profile why would i download synapse besides critical maybe updates maybe it sounds like you're being convinced that it's a good thing after all yeah it is but it's just not good right now <laughs> <laughs> it's tra it's tragic right now <laughs> it's hard to look at right now not even worth downloading the update um is that all that we oh no sorry yep. we got the weird little walking robot <laughs> oh boy the stuff that i find in the science section um so a group of Northwestern University, MIT, and University of Vermont researchers asked a custom AI um, LLM, large language model, which was trained on um, billions of years of evolutional data in animals and also trained to create new robotic designs. They asked it, design a robot that can walk. And in 26 seconds, the AI produced a blueprint for a robot that was then created through 3D <laughs> printing. Um, the robot like went monsters. through several iterations because what it initially produced, the, what the design that it, it initially produced was, um, it looked like a cube of slime and it didn't have any legs. And then on the 10th iteration of its design, um, reconfiguring it actually car added legs into its road <laughs> into you're laughing at it costa this is oh a feat God. of artificial intel intelligence engineering and you're laughing i, I think <laughs> i think we're fine if this is what ai is producing like look at it there's like a one minute 10 in the video it's just like uh, you would call, i wouldn't even call those legs it's just sitting there it's disgusting like it's like awful a, like a that slime <laughs> blob so yeah, hold on, just disgusting. let me explain this to the listeners here. So we're we're <laughs> we're looking at a slime. It looks like a cube of sl hard gelatin that mm -hmm. the AI has then carved like I don't know rectangular legs. It's got th three legs. Three Calling legs. Them legs is a stretch. It is. It is a stretch, it's and it moves very slowly by breathing in quotation is, marks yeah. so this is how this is what the alien oh sorry the ai created to be a living robot creature that can walk it's basically something from a david cronenberg movie like the yeah Fly, it is it is or something like that it's a pulsating blob that pulsates and as it pulsates in its disgusting pulsating way it moves slowly and slowly, just because it's pulsating, it, and it's, it's more so shaking, you, and it's going to attach itself to your head, and then it's going to dig parasites into your brain and take you over. And look this how what stoked created. this scientist is. He and goes as excited. far to say, he goes as far to say that this 
AI has birthed a quote unquote new organism through quote unquote instant evolution. And let's give him some credit here. This mm-hmm. is what he's this is what he has done. He he explains that evolution doesn't have um, foresight for what it's going to encounter. And AI now does. So if you give it a, if you feed an AI all of the evolution, the appropriate evolutional data, and then pose it a question of, can you create a robotic organism that is capable of, you know, surviving in X, Y, Z environments, then it will be able to spit out a design for that, that then researchers can then build upon. So yep. it's a very interesting idea. It's getting AI, it's essentially getting robots to build robots. But what we're starting off with looks like a cube of slime from RuneScape. Yep. Yep. That you train Slayer on. This is like, this is, it's haunting. The video mm-hmm. goes for two minutes. Audio listeners, I'd recommend you go watch it. It is yeah. fascinating, horrifying. You might have a dream about it. It's nightmare fuel. It's, um, yeah, it's science. Science happening right now. It's really funny, actually, looking at it. I'm just looking at the thing moving. He's like, this is a new organism. The walking <laughs> robot. He's got a bike pump hook up, hooked up to it. Oh, my oh God. God. Okay. Oh, boy. I think that's where we leave this week's yeah. um, TT With that show. that slice uh, of nightmare fuel, let's... Uh straight nightmare fuel um if you've made it this far thank you very much for listening go like comment and subscribe um thank you very much to for be quiet for the interview and um yeah yeah do you have anything else to sign off with uh no no check out the intel arc gpu review and yeah stay tuned for next week when we talk about what's in the asteroid that's right all right thank you very much guys for listening See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.